Good evening, everyone. My name is Jack Hanna, and I'm a board member of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, and I welcome you here tonight to our uh, uh, webinar with regard to the National Infrastructure Bank Financing the Opportunity Economy. Um, and we have many uh, wonderful guests tonight, and I uh, want to prompt um, introducing them very quickly because some have time constraints within the next 20 minutes. And I want to start uh, now in order to um, enable them to make their presentations before we leave. So I'm going to start off tonight with um, uh, Alfeka Mutardi, who's going to give a very short uh, presentation with regard to our legislation advocating for the creation of a national infrastructure bank, HR 4052. Alfeka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Great to see a lot of new, uh, the same faces and some new faces as well. So my name is Alfeka Mutardi. I'm a macroeconomist, and I'm going to start out by just introducing the bill especially to those people who might be new on these calls. Uh, this is the theme of tonight's talk is the how do we finance the, uh, um, uh, uh, the opportunity economy. The way that we do that is through a national infrastructure bank. We have a specific bill in Congress, H.R. 4052, that creates a $5 trillion bank. It currently has 40 co-sponsors on the bill, including the main sponsor, Rep. Danny Davis from Chicago, Illinois. And we're actively, the coalition is actively seeking more members with help from, from folks like yourself uh, to come onto this bill. I'll come back to you later and tell you a little bit more about specifically how it can do this, especially in today's context of our economy. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alfeka. And I'm now going to uh, have our... Uh, uh, three important guests that have time constraints with regard to this evening uh, make their presentations. And the first will be Representative Justin Fleming uh, from the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, Dolphin County. And uh, Representative Fleming, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. The floor is yours. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And, you know, you think I'd have this figured out by now, but uh, I just want to say thank you. It's been it's been a, a pleasure to get to learn about the potential of a national infrastructure bank. Uh, I am in the state house in Pennsylvania, um, but myself and my colleague, Emily Kincaid, uh, had the distinct pleasure uh, when we were in Chicago to uh, attend a panel uh, that was given on the National Infrastructure Bank and just really hear from folks from all across the country about how investment in a national infrastructure bank can be helpful. And when I first sat down with Stu and the team and uh, really heard about, you know, how we can unlock the economy by investing in a national infrastructure bank, I was sold. Uh, this puts people to work it, uh, on projects that are shovel ready. This allows us to build out our infrastructure in ways that we know are vulnerable. Uh, when we talk about things like our electricity grid, when we talk about things like our lack of high speed rail, um, you know, more needs on our highways, roads and bridges. I mean, Pennsylvania has tens of thousands of bridges, um, most of which are deficient, quite frankly, uh, when, when you look at their grades. And so uh, I know this would be a win for Pennsylvania. Um, I would like to work with my colleagues in uh, next session uh, to see if we can perhaps get a resolution passed in our state house. And I've also spoken with uh, members of Congress here in our state delegation that I know urging them to sign on to this bill and that work will continue. So I'd like to thank Stu and you, Jack, for having me. I do have a time constraint tonight, um, but it's a pleasure to be on with you. And uh, hopefully we can uh, continue the great work of getting this done and, and re realizing um, that this type of investment can unlock our economy for all across the country, uh, for, for those all across the economic spectrum. So thank you so much for having me this evening. Representative Fleming, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we greatly appreciate your words and support. And uh, we, we look forward to working together with you in order to advocate for the bank 
to make this happen. Next. Absolutely. Like thank to, you, sir. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce a, a state senator from Massachusetts who is joining us tonight, Senator Jamie Eldridge. Uh, from uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts, and uh, he also has time constraints tonight. So we thank you for joining us and appreciate your efforts. And uh, we would greatly hear your comments uh, uh, tonight and please proceed. Great, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jack. And um, like Representative Fleming, I, I was also at the one of the forums at the Democratic National Convention uh, by the Coalition for the National Infrastructure Bank and was just really impressed with the discussion. I, I came to the forum because I'm actually the Senate author in Massachusetts on a bill uh, to create a state-owned bank um, because Massachusetts, just like every state in, in the country, uh, has a real uh, serious infrastructure gaps. Uh, we have a $40 billion water infrastructure gap, both uh, drinking water and wastewater. We have a transportation system that continues to be fairly infamous for, for not working well. Um, and our roads and bridges, similar to what Representative Fleming said, are, are fairly deficient as, as well. And so I was really captivated by it. Uh, great meeting with Stu and, and Alfeca and the entire team. Um, and so I'm incredibly excited about this because I, I think what we know, and I've certainly experienced this in, in the Massachusetts legislature, is that even though many of my colleagues know that there is this infrastructure gap, uh, there is not yet the political will uh, to find a way to pay for much of it, um, despite some of our efforts. And so the idea that this uh, National Infrastructure Bank could be created, uh, obviously, by congressional legislation, uh, that would not cost any taxpayer dollars relying on treasury bonds, et cetera, uh, and could uh, fill the gap that unfortunately the bipartisan infrastructure law and the infrastructure Inflation Reduction Act has not filled uh, and recognizing that unfortunately those laws are only addressing about I think around 10% of the nation's infrastructure needs. So I'm incredibly excited, really impressed with the team and what I've uh, already been doing, thanks to, to, to Stu's help, is uh, reaching out to uh, congressmen and women in Massachusetts, including my own congresswoman, uh, to get them to sign on. Because I, I, I think with the exception of one congressperson, uh, none, none of the rest of the mass delegation has signed on. So um, that's what I'll be working on, as well as reaching out to my state legislative colleagues. And just great to be here with so many state uh, legislative uh, elected officials from across the country. So um, thanks so much for organizing this seminar. Um, count me in and uh, very enthusiastic about this. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Senator Eldridge. And let me just add that one of the uh, 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 impressions that I've gotten over working with this uh, effort over the past five years is um, Local elected officials completely understand the need for infrastructure and how it affects their constituents and that uh, in order for us to succeed economically, we must have a first rate uh, infrastructure development in order to compete internationally as far as the economy is concerned. So thank you for your comments and your support and effort. And now I'm going to pivot to our third guest, who also has time constraints, uh, from Pennsylvania, my home state, and uh, being from Indiana, Pennsylvania, only about 60 miles away. We're very pleased and happy to have the support and the participation tonight of Representative Emily uh, Emily Kincaid uh, from the House of Representatives here in Pennsylvania from Brighton Heights. And Emily, thank you for joining us tonight. And we're anxious to hear your comments and thank you for participating. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I apologize for being a little bit late. I was having technical difficulties, which uh, I think that Zoom always has to update uh, anytime that you log into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, I thank you guys. Uh, I mean, in many ways, what what you know, what I would say has already been said um, because it, it's just common sense. This is common sense to have a national infrastructure bank because this is a way that we have proven in the past 
we can actually build up our infrastructure. And we are now reaching the end of the life of infrastructure that was built with the, na the last National Infrastructure Bank. And in Pittsburgh, where I am, uh, you know, we are seeing, uh, you know, weekly, we're seeing our, uh, our, our water main pipes break because they're 100 years old. And, and it is not anybody's fault except that they are aged and, and we don't have the funding to be able to actually repair them and to keep up with roads at, at a level where we're, we are paving them at a replacement level. We are, we are desperately trying to, you know, put our finger in the dam, uh, and, and, you know, it's not working. And I, you know, I think the reality is that we are really harming ourselves by not doing this. And, and, you know, so I have, I really appreciate the fact that you guys are, uh, you know, building this coalition and working so hard to make sure that we are actually, you know, pushing our federal elected officials to get this done because it's, it is just, um, it's beyond me that that we wouldn't, you know, that we wouldn't do this already. Um, and now, you know, I think that part of the problem, part of what we see is, you know, public-private partnerships don't work. And I think everybody here kind of knows that and understands that because they just aren't, that they're not sustainable. But there's a lot of private business that, uh, you know, sees that as a, as a way of, of, you know, making money. And, and so there's, you know, questions about, you know, whether or not we actually should move away from that model, even though every time that we do a project with a public private partnership, it comes back and it's like, well, what do you mean now we have to pay for it? Um, but I think about a lot of times, so in Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is located, we have uh, the Allegheny County League of Muni Municipalities and they have a conference every year and they have a legislative panel every year and they talk about, they ask us, what is it that you guys can do to help us with infrastructure? And I, you know, I'm like, oh, I know the answer to this. <laughs> we can push people to do a national infrastructure bank. And, and the moderator was like, well, but that's the federal level. It's not the state level. I'm like, well, that's the reality is uh, that we have to recognize is that while the states really want to do this and while the states get it, we do not have the power, we do not have the funding to be able to meet the need. And, and so this has to happen at the federal level. And this is a, an acknowledgement of how every level of government has to work together in order to get this done. And, uh, you know, so, so I'm excited to keep pushing on this. Uh, Representative Fleming and I spent, uh, you know, the time in Chicago at, at the DNC, and I think we spent more time talking about the National Infrastructure Bank um, and just how, you know, like, you know, look at Chicago and look at their public transit and look at all these things, look at the waterway and look at the riverfront. And, you know, if we had the National Infrastructure Bank, imagine what we could do in Pennsylvania with this. And it, you know, it's, it is, um, it's exciting to get to work with all of you guys to actually make this happen because, uh, because it's, it's far past you. And, uh, so thank you. Thank you all for your time. And, and obviously anything that I can do to keep pushing this, I'm, I'm happy to do. Thank you, Representative Kincaid. We appreciate your support and, uh, we will rely on your assistance and efforts going forward. And, um, and undoubtedly, we agree with you that, first of all, Alexander Hamilton's concept of investing in our country as far as our infrastructure is concerned was brilliant and has been proven uh, over the course of the past <laughs> 250 years, number one. Number two, uh, uh, infrastructure is how the economy functions and uh, efficiently. And if you don't have roads, if you don't have communications, if you don't have energy supplies, uh, if you don't have transportation if, uh, needs that are fulfilled for the economy, you're not going to be as successful 
uh, as far as producing goods and services. And this is what the National Infrastructure Bank does. And it is something that is beyond, I suggest, uh, private financial interest. They are interested in making money, but we are interested in building an economy for the country. And this is a vehicle and a mechanism by which we're able to accomplish that. And with that, I'm going to pivot back to our economists, uh, Alfek and Mutardi, uh, who will explain some of the details of how this functions. And then we'll proceed with the other guests that will be speaking uh, thereafter. So Alfeka, your turn to make your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. So since I'm a macroeconomist, I hope you'll indulge me. I always try and uh, kind of give a backdrop of where we are on the economy because it sets up a lot of the discussion for what do we need for an economic program. Uh, so I'll just start off by uh, giving you a real quick uh, uh, flash look at it as of uh, today. Uh, the economy is giving off mixed signals. Uh, GDP growth is growing fairly robustly by 3% in the second quarter. 4% is going to be the same in the uh, third quarter. Consumer sentiment is improving, but the job market is slowing down a little bit, and the housing market is still in huge crisis. Uh, with people very struggling to cover their rents and shelters filling to capacity and um, uh, food, infl uh, food insecurity and that kind of thing. Also, manufacturing is down. And uh, manufacturing, while it's only 8% of the economy, it's kind of like a, a bird in the coal mine. It kind of gives off an early si signal about where the economy is. But the fact that it's uh, still pushing downwards means that the government programs, the bipartisan infrastructure law, the climate bill, the CHIPS bill, they have not yet raised the demand for manufacturing products. That just means they're just they're too small to do that so far. They're a great start, too, but just too small. The Fed lowered its interest rates by a half a percent. That's supposedly to you know take off the brakes on pushing down on the economy, but inequality is rising. Uh, and uh, CEO pay is going through the roof. Bidenomics is not reaching the working poor. And then finally, the federal budget is still running huge deficits. I always start with this. This is a big picture item. Uh, the the uh, deficit for this fiscal year is $1.9 trillion. It's supposed to continue at $2 trillion a year for the next decade. Uh, that's, so that means that it'll increase from Thirty-four trillion today to uh, to another twenty-two trillion over two, ten years. That's just unsustainable. Interest on the debt is now even above um, defense spending. So this is the constraint. Here is the constraint right here for why we need an off-budget national infrastructure bank to pay for infrastructure. So um, the uh, the next thing I wanted to point out was where we are on in the presidential campaigns uh, as to suggestions for economic platforms, because again, this runs into the budget constraint. So Donald Trump, of course, wants to lower taxes. Uh, he wants to extend the 2017 tax cut. He wants to cut corporate taxes further altogether. This is gonna add, in addition to the 22 trillion, another $8 trillion onto the federal deficit. He also wants to put on a uh, slap on four trillion dollars in tariffs for imports coming into the country uh, so that he thinks that will stimulate domestic manufacturing jobs. Well, we're not quite sure. But one thing we are sure of is that it will hugely increase inflation. Why? Because all of the retailers will pass on these higher import costs along to their customers. Uh, and it could cost trade wars um, uh, as we put tariffs on imported goods, those importers will uh, put tariffs on our goods as well. That's what happened with uh, the Trump tariffs that really hurt farmers uh, a few years back. And he wants to end Biden era climate spending and he wants to slash regulations, including for banks. So um, not clear that any of that is going to really help the people who need it the most, which are the middle class and lower class workers who are struggling to get by. Kamala Harris uh, has just yesterday put it, came out with her new uh, program. Uh, she calls it a new way forward for the middle class. Uh, she wants to raise taxes on the rich so that they pay, pay the same share as, as middle class taxpayers. That's only fair. And restore tax credits for uh, 
for parents. She wants to stimulate manufacturing and small businesses with tax breaks for entrepreneurs. And then she wants to go after these shiny industries, you know, bio manufacturing, aerospace, artificial intelligence, not any mention here of infrastructure whatsoever, <laughs> too bad to say. She wants to build affordable housing uh, and put, give down payment uh, breaks, breaks to first time home buyers. And altogether, her spending plans will increase the deficit beyond the 22 trillion that's going to rise in addition to the next 10 years by another one and a half trillion and without a plan to how to pay for that. It's a centrist appeal to businesses, that's great, but she also cites uh, pr past president's plans uh, like Lincoln, Eisenhower, FDR and Kennedy, uh, but she does not mention their off budget banks. And uh, this is just a real shame. We've had four really large banks like this in our nation's past. Uh, which were backed by six American presidents on both sides of the aisle, whatever the aisle was at the time, starting after the American Revolutionary War, going through the Great Depression of World War II. They were hugely successful. And the re reason they're not around anymore was because their charters timed out. Other countries around the world use this model. It's a proven model. And it's off budget. Uh, so it does not, uh, as former for, uh, previous speakers have mentioned, does not affect uh, calls on the budget. So the solution in our vision is to use infrastructure as the base building block for stimulating the economy. Why? Because this kind of investment is the best kind of investment that you can make. Every dollar that you uh, that the bank will lend and put into an infrastructure project will bring back three dollars back into the economy. It'll reshore American manufacturing, double GDP growth. That's the only way we're going to solve our deficit problem is is to grow out of it. It'll reduce inflation, offset Saturday coming recession, and it's the only way to ensure that an, that we have an opportunity economy that reaches everybody. It'll rebuild American industries because they'll have the electricity, the roads, and every other bit of infrastructure that they need. It'll grow small and medium businesses. Uh, lots of business opportunities to do the construction. Workers will benefit. Poverty and income inequality will be reduced. It will reach every area, rural, urban, and improve state and state and local finances, which a lot of uh, these legislators can tell you that that's they have a big budget constraints on their own uh, legislation, on their own uh, state budgets. And it fully finances everything. That's the beauty of it. It's off budget and fully finances everything. Uh, just look at the infrastructure law that we have in place right now. It's only one tenth of all the money that we need to cover everything. Look at the big gaps. Here's the here's the can't pay for water infrastructure and leaking water pipes and lead service lines. Uh, this bank will cover all of it. It'll be a place where we can do better planning of our infrastructure. Make sure that we have affordable housing in place next to train stations with uh, the power grid adequate to provide the electricity for everything. It'll all be covered. So this is the way, this is the concrete plan for having an opportunity economy for all. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alfeca. And let me just add that, um, uh, as Alfeca just mentioned, it's been 80 years since we've had a national infrastructure bank, which was the last huge surge of development of infrastructure within our country, which um, enabled the United States of America to um, arise out of the depression and the economic uh, adverse consequences that resulted from that, and also prepare us for World War II. Uh, and um, we have not reinvested in our infrastructure since then. The, you know, the time is now, we need to do this. And it's the brilliance of Alexander Hamilton that created what's called the American system as, a, as opposed to the British system, which uh, enabled Great Britain to develop itself economically solely through private industry. Uh, and the contrast between that and the American system is that we employ public finance, uh, private financing through a public mechanism in order to have the financing occur to the for the benefit of the entire country as opposed to private interests. It's a brilliant system that has worked, as Alfeca has just mentioned before, four times, and the most successful of which was during the Depression. But now I would like to 
proceed to the rest of uh, the guests that we would like to have speak tonight. And our next in line is Senator David, I'm going to say Kohler, but please forgive me if I misstate. Uh, <laughs> it's actually Kaler, but that's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my apologies, uh, uh, Senator Kaler. Uh, from Illinois, uh, 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 Illinois State Senate, and uh, uh, from Peoria. So, uh, Senator, you have the floor, and thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, it was it was great to to see a lot of you uh, at the uh, DNC in Chicago. And uh, uh, Illinois was uh, was was uh, very proud to be able to host that. And Chicago, I think, the weather was always like that in Chicago, like in the low seventies, no humidity. <laughs> so, so uh, I hope you had a good impression of it. But uh, one thing that um, I want to add to the discussion, uh, and and I. I really have become a believer in this uh, because I don't think any state has the capacity alone to be able to do this. It's going to take the federal government, it's going to take the Treasury Department, uh, all of that uh, as a resource for us to be able to do this. Um, but the one thing I would I would like to add to the list, uh, Alfeca, is housing. And I, I sent an article to uh, to Stewart uh, that I saw in the in the uh, New York Times the other morning. Uh, by uh, Representative Alexandria uh, Ortezio Cortez and uh, Rep and Senator uh, Tina Smith from Minnesota, uh, that talked about the housing crisis. And uh, <clears throat> you know, the the housing crisis is something that hits every community uh, across the nation. Uh, I experienced it uh, here in Central Illinois. We uh, I, I covered not only Peoria but Bloomington Normal. Uh, Normal Illinois is where Rivian uh, has built their electric cars. It's in my district. Uh, when they when they first bought the old Mitsubishi plant, uh, people were happy to think that maybe there'd be a thousand people working there. Well, today there's more than nine thousand people working there. Uh, they're adding on to it. They're going to build the, their two new models uh, in Illinois rather than Georgia, and uh, so it's it's created uh, such a housing crisis that my own staff person who staffs my Bloomington Normal office had to actually move to Lincoln to be able to find affordable housing. That's about uh, forty, you know, thirty forty miles away. Um, they are drawing from a 90 mile radius just because people can't get housing close by. Uh, so it's, it's not only just a matter of price, it's a matter of whether it's available. So I think if we would add housing to that list, and, and uh, I think it fits within that, uh, that's something that really becomes a pocketbook issue that that uh, families can identify with. I mean, it's a little hard to identify with a bridge or, you know, <laughs> a highway because they're they're not personal. But a house is very personal, and uh, so I would uh, I would like to add that to the list and to, and to see what we can uh, do to help further that uh, that whole issue. Um, uh, and I wondered whether those two people are are in fact uh, supporters. Is AOC uh, a signer on the uh, Danny Davis bill? She is, yes, I, I thought she probably would be. Um, and I've talked to Nikki Bazinski, who is a, a congresswoman, a personal friend of mine uh, from the 13th district here in uh, Illinois. Uh, Eric Sorensen is my own congressman. He's from the 17th district. I think once we get the uh, campaign uh, season over with, we'll be able to uh, zero in on, on uh, more of those folks. But uh, uh, I thought we had a good discussion in Chicago. I think this is the right issue. Uh, I think this next year, hopefully, will be the right time. So. Uh, with that, I'll uh, I'll be all ears to listen. You're you're muted, Jack. Thank you so much. My apologies. Uh, thank you very much, Senator. Greatly appreciate your comments and your support. Next, our uh, speaker uh, that we have. Uh, on uh, our agenda is Randy Voller, the former chair of the North Carolina Democratic Party, uh, who is from Pittsburgh and a very important role in the past and who obviously has an understanding of North Carolina politics and how uh, 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 the state can benefit uh, as far as having its, in its infrastructure be improved and uh, uh, employ a national infrastructure bank in order to assist in that efforts. So Randy, uh, we're uh, very pleased to have you join us tonight and we would like to hear your comments. The, and please proceed. Thank you for having me on the call. I actually spent time as a kid living in Pittsburgh and 
uh, I'm probably one of the few people that have lived. I was the mayor here of Pittsburgh, named for William the Pitt, and also lived in Pittsburgh. So, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Of course, we know which the important one is Pittsburgh. I'd have to say uh, I worked through local government and public policy and, of course, became our state party chair after being county and congressional district and got to know a number of the elected officials from the state level and those that are serving in D.C., and worked in building these systems, generally water, sewer, grading, infrastructure, as well as working on the public side. And it's apparent to me that if we are going to solve these problems, and of course I came to NIB by going to one of these speeches in, in Chicago as a delegate, and they happened to be handing out brochures after our breakfast. So I got to meet the astronaut, Mark Kelly, and next thing I know, I'm meeting Stuart. So we went, went from meeting Senator Kelly to Stuart and, and, and seeing an amazing presentation there. It's, uh, it's something that we all know is needed, and the question is how we can implement it. I mean, the, the issue we have at the local level is you have all of these needs for infrastructure, whether they're publicly owned or they're public-private, and in order to fund them, you have to float a bond or get a loan so, or try to get grant money from the federal, money, or federal government or the state. And as I've been on calls subsequently with Alveca and Stuart and others, that you know, the bottom line is when the money comes down, even from these very amazing bills going all the way back to when the ARRA was done in 2009 by Obama, it usually gets trapped at the state anyway and takes an awful long time to filter out to the counties, even if they are, quote, shovel ready sites. And we all know that shovel ready sometimes means a, a, a job that people didn't want, but happen to have construction plans that were sealed. It may not even be the best investment of the money. So I think getting a bank actually rolling in the way that I've read through your materials is the most elegant solution to getting money in the community, getting a velocity of money floating in the community, you know, where the econometrics can be tracked and you can see how this money is spending and address these needs that you have listed and go state by state, county by county, state by state. Because right now uh, you're perpetually facing the problem that if any of you have served in local government, which I have, you know, county, local level, where, where the rubber meets the road, you never have enough money to do the project and you always have people on your board that are afraid to spend money because they're used to looking at checkbook. We have to balance our budget. You are used to looking at what you're used to dealing with at home. So when you're talking about millions and millions of dollars for projects, people lock up and they, they don't want to spend. And what I will tell you is like on a water system or a sewer system, things that we bid out in 2010 where I said, hey, the town needs a new water system are now three times as expensive today as they were in 2010. So I think it's imperative that we get this up and running and, and get this going because I don't see a way in our country for addressing not only the needs for operation and maintenance, which I'm very much aware of from the public private side that we have to replace but we also have a consistent need for maintenance, which isn't necessarily being done. But also we need new infrastructure. Uh, and on your list that you showed, you know, whether it's broadband or affordable housing options or affordable living options or what have you, it needs to be built. And there's no clear way of getting it done without the money. And, with, and the only way to kind of take this country back and put people to work and create the kind of democracy that we all support is by getting control of the money. And this is a clear and simple way to put the money where it needs to be so that entities can go ask for a loan or apply and get it back in their community and build projects that are needed. And it's not something foreign when, you know, I'm a real estate developer, I'm a planner and developer. When we build things, we turn it over to the town anyway or the county. So essentially, I'm already getting private financing from a commercial bank and turning over said infrastructure for the public good. So the notion of borrowing money that's not bond money and doing this, it's not alien. We do it every single day. This just puts the money where it needs to be in the hands of entities that need to be applying for the greatest possible good. And I would love to help. Uh, in, in this state, I do know a number of the folks. I've already been on some calls with them. For, for congressional members to try to get someone in the state to sponsor 
or join as a co-sponsor, but I, I would love to help in our state. And of course, I know people through my labor connections and others in other states, but I do think this is an incredibly important idea. And I count myself as a new dealer, even though I'm, I'm a young person, I wasn't born then. But if we're, if we're not going to try to go back to what made this country a really wonderful country to begin with by what FDR and others did, I think that we're, we're staring down the barrel of a very bad 21st century. And this is a clear step for making the right move. So thank you for letting me speak to that. Randy, th that was a great expression of what the purpose and the intent and the accomplishment that a national infra infrastructure bank will have. And uh, we thank you for joining us tonight and very much appreciate those comments. Well said. Um, let us uh, return to see uh, if uh, Lily is uh, home yet, and if not, uh, we will proceed to our, our next speaker, uh, uh, Carlos, that I'll introduce. Uh, oh, here's Lily now. So uh, thank you for joining us tonight, and uh, we're very pleased that you've done so, and uh, you're very prompt as far as getting out of the <laughs> car and, and in front of your computer, so Yes, yes. I wanted to properly speak where people can see me. Um, uh, so I didn't want to be speaking from my car or behind the wheel being unsafe. Thank you for having me again. And I have grown very uh, passionate about this subject ever since I, this idea was presented to me. And of course, I'm Maryland State Delegate uh, Lily Chi, representing Montgomery County, Maryland, which is right next to Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. So we're reminded every day of the gridlock and the division and all how Washington is not getting things done. You know, even though we're inch away from the nation's capital, we would like to see ourselves as a different kind of place where things do get done. Um, so as, as all of you know, um, recently, when I say recently, it was a few months ago, when there was uh, this big bridge collapse, uh, the Francis Scott Key bridge collapse in the state of Maryland, Baltimore Harbor, right? That incident was uh, such a reminder and a symbol of this state of American infrastructure all across the country. You know, it was just uh, a, a very timely reminder of the need to have our own um, infrastructure bank in order to prevent things from happening, but also to quickly fix things. Now we are talking about lawsuits. We're not talking about all kinds of economic losses, direct and indirect in so many ways. But bridges and roads are just the physical infrastructure part where we can touch and feel. I heard someone talking about housing infrastructure. And in my district, which is geographically very diverse from very urban to very rural areas, we also have urban deserts. We also have food deserts in rural communities, right? Those are also social infrastructure and hospital and medical centers, the EV charging stations and all that. These are important infrastructures that could dramatically improve America's competitiveness and community's quality of life. One thing I always refer back to is why people like me came to America. You know, a lot of people did not know that I actually grew up in China during the Cultural Revolution. I grew up in China at a time when there was no private sector. And of course, if I had known how China would have grown by leaps and bounds, I probably would not have been so naively determined to say I must go to America to pursue a better quality of life, right? But, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, China became a different country, became a different country. Um, on, the, on the flip side, the United States is increasingly acting like we have lost the will to compete, the will to do big things, the will that drew so many of us to this country to begin with. And that's a damn shame because we have the deepest global talent, right? We have the best of the R&D institutions, but we have lost the political will to do big things. And in this country, unfortunately, infrastructure money is a lot of times pushed down to state and local government, which is why we don't have the money because we have to balance the budget, you know? And the federal government is the only entity that can incur debt. But if we leave it to the federal government's will, it's just not going to get done because of the political division. And so for all these reasons that you, uh, many of you have articulated, I believe strongly it is time for America to turn a page and to be very serious about economic competitiveness for all the great things that 
uh, VP Kamala Harris mentioned about biomanufacturing, about clean energy infrastructure and all of that. We need infrastructure to actually be an enabler to make all these things happen. So I believe very strongly uh, in the NIB idea and we'll do whatever we can to push that forward. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, uh, Delica Chi, thank you so much for your um, words of support and uh, advocacy for the bank. Uh, we greatly appreciate that and agree wholeheartedly in what you've just said and described and value your support. Next, I would like to proceed to introduce to you the chair of the Brooklyn, New York Young Dems, uh, which we're very pleased to have join us. And uh, please forgive me, I am terrible at languages and pronunciations. So, uh, um, Carlos uh, Cazadilla Palacio. And, That's pretty uh, good. <laughs> all That's right. Good. Thank, uh, thank well, you, everyone. Carlos. Uh, yes, I'm, Thank, Carlos, I'm uh, happy to have you here. Thank you for joining us and your turn to speak. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much for, for having me and for the whole coalition. Um, the Carlos Calcedia Palacio, which you got very close. You got very close. Um, and um, I'm the president of Brooklyn Young Democrats. I'm also a delegate. Um, I was in Chicago. I met Stewart. Um, and I'm just so excited for this national infrastructure uh, bank and this incredible coalition. Um, you know, we're the wealthiest nation in the world, in the history of the world, and it is inexcusable that we don't have a cutting edge infrastructure. Um, and it's because it's a problem of political will. And that's the reality. Um, and we need, uh, you know, as, as young people, especially, but all, obviously all of us together, uh, but just, you know, speaking as, as a young person, uh, I mean, we need a, a sustainable and prosperous um, future. Uh, and we have to start now. Uh, and and th th there's crumbling infrastructure everywhere. Uh, I, I do have to say it's been it's been amazing how the Biden-Harris uh, administration was able to pass uh, this uh, this historic infrastructure bill, uh, which the previous administration failed to pass, no matter how many infrastructure weeks uh, were announced. Um, but it's still not enough, right? It's not sustainable enough. What we need to do is to insulate, um, you know, our infrastructure projects through this National Infrastructure Bank from these political games and partisan um, fights uh, that every year really, um, you know, control, um, you know, our our future. Uh, and then nothing really gets done of, uh, of substantial need. Um, and, you know, we really should catch up with the rest of the world. Uh, I also, in my in my day job, I'm the district director for a state center in New York, Andrew Gennardis. So I, uh, in Brooklyn, see every day, A, the good things about, for example, the infrastructure bill and when there is federal funding, but also uh, where we fall short. Uh, we have the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, uh, which is one of the... Um, you know, largest expressways, and it's, it's it's a relic of the Robert Moses era, and uh, the 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 middle part, the triple cantilever, is falling apart, and we have uh, it's 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 tens of thousands of cars uh, basically per hour, uh, and it's falling apart, uh, and we are thanks to the infrastructure bill, we'll, we'll be able to get that fixed, but you know that highway has cut through communities. I mean, uh, it has a racist legacy. You know, it has. It's called Asthma Alley. You know, I, I myself, you know, I live close to to the BQ, BQE, and I have an inhaler. You know, I mean, these, uh, you know, these infrastructure when it's not done in a sustainable way, um, especially the ones that done from a long time ago. Um, we need to we need to think about the future. And if we had a national infrastructure bank, we could tear that that whole thing down. And really connect communities but the the most we can do is a compromise where we fix up the middle part and we try to see what things here and there we can do in the northern part and the southern part um to reduce the pollution and reduce the harm uh but it is not the ideal and we can't do the ideal because it's too expensive on an offshore wind for example um here in brooklyn in the district that i work for for the senator um we're, we're leading uh the state in in uh, in offshore wind and renewable energy um, but you know, these projects, they cost money and we could be doing more at a faster rate. Um, but we have to do it with, with the money we have. The inflation reduction act has been obviously amazing, but it can't be whenever once in a blue moon, when we have an administration and, 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 uh, you know, and that was a razor margin that these things passed, uh, having something sustainable is going to be critical. Um, but we're going to blue highways, the ports here in Brooklyn, like there's just so much that we could do, uh, to have a mo modern ports. Uh, modern roads, also public transportation, which is something young people really care about. 
Um, I mean, the cost of living, the cost of transportation, uh, but also the cost to our health. Um, and we could be creating a people-centered cities uh, where we're investing in, in, our, in our trains and our buses. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that would be uh, something that we wouldn't have to see if the state can bring in money and whenever the federal government needs to, we can actually make an equitable, reliable uh, and as effective as possible public transportation that gets cars off the streets and we get uh, it's healthier for everyone. Um, it, it, the, the, the air is cleaner. And um, at the end of the day, you know, working class people will benefit the most of these infrastructure projects. Um, and we need to build more housing. I mean, uh, we're, we're all in the housing crisis is, uh, is, is an affordable housing crisis. And then there's not enough housing stock. And also, and we could solve that, right? But we we need the money. It's expensive, but it it the the economic output is just so it, it it's worth it a million times. And also public housing, which I see every day, and it is it is horrible seeing how public housing. We have NYCHA here in New York, um, where we have half a million residents, but public housing around the country has been severely underfunded, and these are due to decades long racist policies of just allowing public housing to, to crumble and to, to live in conditions that no one should live in, no matter where in the world, but especially in the United States. And, and it's because every year public housing relies on Congress and the allocations are smaller and smaller. Um, and that's decades and decades of crumbling infrastructure. People have mold. I mean, people are dying because of this lack of infrastructure. With an infrastructure bank, we can invest what what public housing needs, which is eighty billion dollars across the country. That unfortunately did not get passed uh, in Congress, and so many lives are at stake. And, and lastly, you know, I want to I want to talk about something uh, also related is that I'm also the founder of Disrupt Project 2025, which you know we're trying to raise awareness about the the dangers of Project 2025 and that blueprint um, that 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 um, that you know Trump would like to implement uh, in his in his team. But the thing is that like on Project 2025, they want to just so you all know they want to eliminate funding for the Federal Transit Administration's core programs to fund transit maintenance. Uh, which would undermine economic growth. They want to eliminate um, the FTA CIG program, which are the capital investment grants. I mean, this would just would decimate public transportation. It would hurt the MTA here in New York, but also 57% of transportation agencies who receive federal funding are in rural communities, which would also be severely hurt after they've tried to recover from COVID and the deregulation of the EPA. I mean, we need infrastructure that is sustainable, uh, that is green, um, and uh, and really have a, a future that we can be excited about um, and that we're not going back where people aren't getting sick because of lead or because people are getting sick because of deregulation. Um, and we're really excited as a young person, just a person in general, um, about this. And I really hope we can get the support here at Brooklyn Young Democrats. We're going to be trying to pass a resolution uh, to support uh, the National Infrastructure Bank. I'm in. I want to bring more young people. Young people need to care, need to get involved. Uh, and I'll be doing my part, but I appreciate all of you because together, all a cross-generation, multi-generation um, effort to strengthen our democracy. And we, we need to be proud of our country and what our country does um, to its citizens of this generation and future generations. Um, we deserve it. And then really our lives are 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 at stake and in our future. So, and the economy, we bring jobs, we make millions of good paying jobs and really ensure that with it, that not only are we the wealthiest nation in the world, but we care the most about our people in the world. So thank you everyone. I appreciate having time to talk. Carlos, it's so reassuring to hear uh, our youth perceive the challenges that we face as far as our country is concerned going into the future. And, and we thank you for the work that you're doing and uh, 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 embrace your efforts and uh, look forward to working with you. Um, uh, I just want to touch a, a moment on Randy's and Carlos's uh, comments with regard to maintenance, with regard to our infrastructure. What's happened is we've avoided that and deferred our maintenance. And we have numbers on that from economists that reflect the fact that the more we defer, the, 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 the astronomical increase in costs for deferred maintenance is, is uh, irrational as far as us confronting and dealing with these kinds of problems uh, as far as our infrastructure is concerned. Um, also, in addition uh, to that point, uh, Carlos, 
housing is undoubtedly, in my opinion, uh, I think one of the greatest challenges of our country at this moment, as far as infrastructure is concerned. I just moved back after seven years in the West Coast, Portland, Oregon, and I've been to San Francisco and Seattle, and I know it is a crisis there, not only in the West Coast, but all over the country. And we need to get a handle on this housing a uh, crisis that we have, and the National Infrastructure Bank is the, the answer for us to do so. Now I'm going to move on to the strategy that we're employing as far as going forward is concerned uh, to have uh, 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 our uh, plan as far as our legislation is concerned uh, to be passed by Congress. Uh, in order to implement uh, the creation of a national infrastructure bank and, and address the issues that we have. Right now, we have 40 co-sponsors, a sponsor and co-sponsor of our legislation, and we anticipate more coming, and we need to build on that. We have great momentum, especially uh, uh, with that kind of a number as far as support is concerned within Congress regarding the legislation, number one, and we have more co-sponsors on the way that we will be pressing, that we obtained contact with at the convention, which was a huge, in, in my opinion, and our opinion, success as far as our networking is concerned and the, abil uh, the opportunity that we had to communicate and describe uh, uh, to uh, the attendees about the benefits and uh, the importance of having infrastructure and having an infrastructure national bank uh, be employed in order to create it. So we want to advocate more uh, as far as co-sponsors is, uh, is concerned. Uh, uh, Vice President Harris just yesterday gave a speech with regard to uh, her economic plan. And one of the criticisms that has emerged from it is, how will she pay for it? And we have the answer. And that's why our pressing uh, uh, advocacy of the bank and the legislation that creates it is so important right now. This lays the foundation by which we will have the ability and the mechanism by which to build our infrastructure going into the future. So how are we going to do that? We have a one-page flyer that is posted now uh, uh, up on uh, the screen th that you may download and, uh, and start distributing to uh, uh, opinion leaders and elected officials in your community in order to advocate for the bank. And if you are unable to print and uh, 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 yourself uh, the flyers, we will do so for you and send it to you. So please let us know if you're unable to do so. And if you are, please print them and start distributing them as much as possible. We need to build the momentum, which we already have, and it's coming uh, to a critical point where we can be successful. We just need to continue advocating here on in uh, uh, more and more as far as uh, advocacy concerning the bank is concerned. That's number one. Number two, we need money. <laughs> it's the source of all political action and, uh, and we, Thank all of you have, who have supported us in the past financially and politically with regard to your efforts advocating for the bank. But uh, it, it is a critical moment uh, uh, during the campaign where people's focus of attention is now on political matters and the economy, which is the first and foremost issue that everyone is paying attention to. We need to tap into that attention. It's an opportunity that we must not uh, 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 waste and uh, we must employ. So uh, here is uh, 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 the, uh, you can download uh, uh, 
QR code, they can take a picture. Thank you, Angela. That's what I was looking for. So appreciate that. Download the QR code and um, please uh, know that in order for us to be successful, we need to raise money in order to advocate for this policy and any kind of support and assistance that you provide us in doing so is going to make uh, uh, increase the chances of us being successful with regard to this effort. So uh, uh, take a picture of it and please employ it. Uh, uh, also take a look at uh, our website and see the most recent developments that we've had as far as support is concerned, uh, the, the new sponsors as far as the legislation, uh, as far as congressional members are concerned, also local uh, uh, and state government officials and also just interested political ac activists have joined our effort. And if you go to the website, you will see uh, the, the itemized list of many different organizations and entities throughout the entire country, labor unions, uh, state committees, uh, 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 state legislators, uh, 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 across the board. Uh, people understand once we explain to them what an NIB bank does and what it can do for our country, support it. And our job and task in order to be successful is to promote the idea and educate the public. And the more that we do so, the greater support we will, will, will acquire and, uh, and, and provide our success. Now I'm going to turn over the floor to Alfeca again for us to talk about housing and other issues as far as uh, uh, the bank is concerned. And I uh, cede the floor to you. Thank you, Alfeca. Thank you very much. So uh, a lot of speakers talked about the housing crisis, and it really truly is a housing crisis. Uh, the lower po portion of the uh, population can't even make ends meet to pay their rent. Evictions are up. Uh, shelters are at maximum capacity. We really need to do something. Now, there has been movement uh, to try and get more done on housing. Vice President Harris has announced her plan to build 3 uh, million housing units. That will require money from the budget and the budget money is not there. Um, in fact, that budget money for housing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why the biggest slum landlord in the United States is the federal government that has um, you know, lots of units in the New York area that are filled with mold and, and, and not enough of them anyway. We need to do something bigger outside the box on housing. AOC has put in her bills. Uh, she will require money from the budget. She has, it's in the right direction. We love her bill because it's, um, it's um, it's uh, accentuating the idea of social housing, which is housing that stays in public hands and is there for the benefit, or it could be even a co-op. Uh, it, it, it's a self-sustaining uh, public housing entity, uh, stands on its own, is it sort of independent as much as it can be from federal and state budget monies. And that can be done. It has been done successfully around the world. The National Infrastructure Bank will build 7 million such housing units, the largest number of any uh, initiative. Uh, and we can do this with good planning as well. We can build public housing uh, uh, that is mixed use, mixed income, uh, has um, you know stores on the bottom, is next to the train station, uh, do lots of ideas, there are lots of ideas around, um, and local, local entities in California, Pennsylvania, New York, they're all starting to move in this direction. And, and we will uh, uh, backstop those, uh, those efforts to build long-term, affordable, sustaining housing. When we have more units, then the price of housing will come down. It's absolutely something the bank will work on and can do. And it's a very high priority for this bank to do because it is in such a crisis mode. I would like to also address uh, what uh, Delicate Chi mentioned about China. Uh, China in the 1970s was a very poor country. Uh, it, the people were food insecure. Uh, they took it upon themselves to develop three development banks 
that brought that country millions and millions of people, billions of people literally, out of poverty uh, and into an industrial class. Uh, they are really outpancing us because they have been spending on infrastructure. Just to go give you an example of the difference between the two, China spends 4.9% of its GDP on transportation infrastructure. Do you know how much the United States spends? Half a percent of GDP. It's a huge difference, a huge difference. We need to do much better than that. We need to fix these bridges to keep them from going down from a ship strike or because they are just simply falling apart. Um, there's no excuse for doing little fixes when we need to do a big fix. We need to keep our transit systems running uh, along. We hugely depend on them. Can you imagine what would happen if the New York subway system went down? And it is in serious financial distress right now. We need to fund all of the backlog of deferred maintenance on these projects. And we need to do much, much more to make our infrastructure resilient to climate change. The, uh, the Union of uh, uh, Concerned Scientists came out with a report uh, last month uh, saying that there are thousands, literally thousands of critical infrastructure pieces that can go underwater. Uh, firehouses, hospitals, public housing, uh, and we're uh, and where and they would be surprised. You would be surprised to know where the uh, uh, catastrophes will be. The worst will be in Florida. You can imagine, uh, new, but also in uh, New Jersey. So we need to work on more dams, levees, and that kind of thing. All of this can be better planned to make our infrastructure more resilient. We have a lot of work to do, and we can't do it piecemeal. We cannot do it through the budget. We need an, an entity that will do long-term planning and provide all of the financing we need. Thank you, Alfeca. And next, uh, we're going to turn to um, uh, questions and answers. And I just want to add before doing so, uh, housing is the critical economic issue as far as the campaign is concerned for presidency. That's why we have to... Um, advocate for the bank because it is the financial instrument by which we can successfully accomplish that task. Now, uh, we have um, first, uh, I'm going to be uh, having uh, Randy Voller ask his question and uh, Damon uh, Arnold will be second and we'll proceed from there. Uh, Randy, uh, your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, my question just has to do with once you were to get the, you know, the $500 billion in treasury bills to capitalize the bank. Uh, in this state, for instance, if you were going to go get a bond or borrow money as a local municipality, it all has to go through the local government commission. Every state handles it differently. I'm just talking about North Carolina. I'm curious that what the rates potentially be or the, and your amortization so that you don't get into this issue where they claim that they can't on balance sheet uh, or through their P&L fund this. So I'm just kind of curious where you're thinking of that. Like, are you pushing it further out to make it affordable for the cash flow and what that would be? You know, that's kind of my main question because ultimately once we can convince people to do this and get around this idea, it's going to come down to the dollars and cents and they're going to want to know, how do I get the money? What are we paying? Can we actually get to this money? Secondly, as someone in the real estate and development business of 34 years, land is 18 to 24%, sometimes higher of the deal. So if you're going to be looking into affordability and I've worked for many years in this sector, it's all about the land and land becomes scarcer and hard to get to and get sewer to and that and the regulations on the land. But it's the land component that makes it really increasingly unaffordable because it's pushed further out, doesn't have services, doesn't have access to transportation and other critical things. So that I could help you with. But that's the key if you really want to get to it. It's all about the land and the use on the land. Great question, Randy. Alfeca. Thank you. So on the question of bonds and lending to uh, local governments or, or municipalities, uh, the way the bank would work would be similar to the bond market. We would look at the borrowing entity's capacity over time to borrow, which would depend on its revenues coming in. Suppose you lent to a water authority, for example, it makes its revenues from charging you know, user fees for water. 
Um, but the interesting thing is that once the NIB helps to do a comprehensive fix of a water system, their finances improve. Uh, we have articles on this. We can lend for, we can stretch out the maturity as, uh, to to the uh, length of the, to, to the lifetime of the infrastructure that's being improved. That helps with the loan. We provide very low interest loans, cost loans, much more than private uh, water companies are, are, are getting from uh, the, from, from, from uh, finance of uh, capital from capital markets right now, but in terms of bonds, we can offer an interest rate that's about a half a percent below the bond market. Plus, we can provide a lot of engineering expertise. A lot of these uh, local municipalities have lost their engineers over time because they couldn't afford to keep paying them. Um, altogether, we can provide engineering support and financial support and better planning. So, for example, we can bundle projects which will save on cost of projects. We could fix the pipes under the road and fix the stormwater drainage problems, which are related and, uh, the, uh, um, and you know, do everything and then fix the road on top. Everybody will save money out of this and spread the borrowing burden across several entities, both the county that owns the road and the water utility that owns the pipes and, and so forth. So altogether, this can be done. It has been done. Uh, it can be well-planned. Uh, and we we expect that we would be able to provide the least cost financing with the best economic benefit coming out of it. Then on the on the in the case of building affordable housing and the question of land costs, you are absolutely right. The secret here is to build um, more dense usage of land, uh, which would be uh, mixed use build uh, uh, apartment buildings and that kind of thing. Uh, build all of the utilities underneath that you need. Uh, for example, an area like Long Island, New York, doesn't even have sewer systems. They have septic tanks all up and down. So you can't do more intensive use uh, building there without uh, addressing you know, the, the, the infrastructure underneath and making the land use more concentrated. And then be build better transportation to those areas as well. This will keep people from having to move out 90 miles from their, you know, their place of employment, which uh, causes a lot of traffic and a, a loss in the quality of life. So altogether, these are things that the bank can work on. Thank you, Elfek. And let me just add uh, the economies of scale is also a, a, an element that will lower costs and create more efficiencies as far as these projects are concerned and uh, that we can employ uh, in addition to the bank uh, to make things uh, uh, lower, uh, less expensive in, in creating them. Uh, Damon, you uh, have a question and we're happy to have you ask it. Uh, please proceed. Oh, thank you very much. And it's, it's an honor being here and listening to all the esteemed people. Um, I'm going to actually just mention a couple of things about my background. I'm a physician, internal medicine, occupational medicine. I used to be a state health official and worked with an incredible uh, Senator Keeler <laughs> in state of wonderful state of Illinois. He did incredible things. And I, I was I did 26 years in the military, two tours in Iraq. And I get back and I'm looking at the division in the country. It is actually like a knife going through my heart uh, because I saw people dying, you know, for this the country to be uh, able to stand. And, uh, you know, Senator Keeler has great ideas. And, you know, and there's so many people who are in legislation right now that want to do something positive. And again, it goes back to the funding issue. And right now we have a diminishing a medical force, 30% of physicians are talking about retiring in the next three years, 40% of nurses in the next three to five, five years. Half of the public health force was lost during COVID-19. And we don't even talk about that. And that is going to be a, a harrowing thing for us to really contend with. And so what, what my question really gets to is that there is also a dimension of this about national security and keeping democracy alive. If, if we don't have a infrastructure plan in place, we are so vulnerable to the country becoming more fragmented than it already is. And this is something that can actually bring people together. I think it's a nonpartisan issue. It's something that actually we need to survive, that both political parties, major political parties to survive. 
in the country. Uh, but I think that we have really talented people in the legislation. And it's just that we need to have that um, tool that they can use in order to get things implemented. So the question is, you know, how does this really tie in? Are you looking at the, the you know, the dimensions of national security and also making sure that this national security from a defensive standpoint, but an offensive standpoint about how we're really building our nation and bringing people together? Thank you very much, Damon. Appreciate your comments. And let me just say this on, in addition to what you've just spoke to, I am of the opinion that a national infrastructure bank and its concept and its advocacy is can be a uniting force with regard to the country. We are a country of builders and doers and manufacturers. And this is a uh, this is beyond politics. This is beyond partisanship. Uh, uh, we like to build things and create things. And it's been the history of our country and, and uh, uh, one of the great aspects of success. And we need to continue that. We have lost it and we need to re-energize it. So next, I'm uh, 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 Delegate Chi, uh, I think uh, you may have some additional comments. And if so, uh, you have the floor and correct me if I'm mistaken. No, actually, I've been enjoying listening to all different perspectives and experts. I'm as much of a student as I'm a policymaker on, on these subjects. So. <laughs> Uh, uh, great, you. and, and uh, hear you there. It's been, uh, it's always the same for me. Uh, uh, Senator Kohler, uh, do you have any additional comments to make before we open it up to uh, anyone else as far as uh, having questions or concerns? And um, uh, if I can get unmuted, yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No, I thought the discussion was was excellent, and uh, uh, I, I think we're all sensing the same thing and what we need to do now is is uh, build some uh, some support from this uh, within our own states make sure that uh, you know i mean we're gonna have to wait till the election settles and 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 we get into uh, next spring with the new congress and uh, and then i think really push hard to make sure that uh, that we get this thing done um, i've got a, a resolution in the senate in illinois uh, that we're going to proceed with uh, uh, as soon as this, you know, the election season just kind of gets in the way of a lot of this. But uh, uh, we we will pass this, and uh, we will get our Illinois delegation on board. And um, you know, I, I think it's going to be necessary. Uh, let's uh, keep my fingers crossed. Let's hope that uh, Madam President will be ready to uh, uh, implement a lot of these things, and uh, uh, you know, we can we can see. Uh, a lot of the work that that uh, President Biden really did with a lot of his stimulation uh, with the, the IRA and uh, uh, with, with all the, the federal legislation that took place and really pumped a lot of money into our economy. We need to continue that. And uh, this is the way to do it. Can't agree with you more. And you're, uh, you're absolutely right. Th this concept resonates with the public in general. And uh, that's why we need to advocate it and promote it. Uh, as far as the public is concerned, because we will succeed. We've seen the success that we've had already, and uh, it, it, this is a common sense policy uh, that resonates uh, throughout the country with all constituencies. Um, I'd like to open the floor to any other people and persons that would like to ask any questions uh, before we sign off tonight. And we thank you all for joining us. And uh, please, uh, we're, uh, we're happy to have you uh, 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 ask any questions. OK, what, I, what, I saw a hand go up there. Uh, uh, and maybe I'm missing it. Please speak up if I missed a hand. Right. I, I'm Jim Birch, and I, uh, I've known a lot of you a long time. I much admire your tenacity for going after this and staying with it so wholeheartedly. Um, another thing that's just as important as housing is, as I sit here in Florida looking at Hurricane Helene and having been ravaged two years ago by Hurricane Ian, it just destroyed this area. I know there's 
climate change is real. It's real. And we haven't spoken about it with the with the urgency that we spoke about it in the last election because it seems to be such a long-term thing that we really can't do much about with an easy fix, except that we can. Um, uh, solar and wind are not uh, able to bridge the gap, but I've been working with a engineer in suburban Baltimore. He works, he has a company called D, D Motion, D is in dog, D is in dog motion.com. And he has invented a, a turbine that will go in the water and had it tested in Canada because you, it takes years to get a permit to put something in the water in America, in America, uh, United States, and it works. And uh, 88,000 of these um, dams, non-energy um, producing dams are in the United States. You just put this in the water, a cable runs out, you can put it in a building and it would solve, uh, In, for example, in the Gulf Stream off the tip of Florida, there's enough energy running there to do 19 times the energy used by the United States today. And it's cheaper to do than any other form of energy and would result in consumers paying about half what they pay and for um, companies that produce the energy to make about the same amount of money. So it's a win all the way around. And this is something that is a natural for the National Infrastructure Bank, just a natural um, to divert some of those funds for that. You don't think you probably have to even do any more funds. You could just divert some of these because it's, you're, and the federal, there, I can't get anybody in the federal government to listen to this because they have hundreds of programs that they put out there in the hopes of achieving this and this fellow didn't use any federal funds, so he's not looked at. But that's there's another great problem that we have in this country today that the National Infrastructure Bank could take care of fairly easily. Thank yeah. you. Jim, I can't agree with you more. Uh, the challenges of uh, uh, climate uh, and global warming are critical, and we we're already seeing the adverse consequences of that. And in order to uh, transform um, our uh, energy uh, uh, systems from uh, carbon to uh, sustainable renewable energy sources will require financing. And it's smart financing because in the back end, we're going to save money and also save the world as far as our environment is concerned. Next, uh, I uh, would like to call on Representative Carolyn Logan from North Carolina. Uh, in order to provide her with an opportunity to speak. So, uh, Carolyn, uh, uh, please uh, 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 share your thoughts and ideas with us tonight. Hi, uh, good evening. I hadn't planned to say anything um, because I had an event planned. Of course, we're going through uh, the beginning of the storm here in North Carolina. So, and I was late getting on because I had a Zoom call uh, earlier this evening, I've enjoyed the um, what I've heard, the conversations I've heard, and of course I'm more you know uh, concerned about the transportation um, infrastructure with highways and bridges. Um, I do feel that that's very important because we have to think about what will happen when we have an interruption in our highways. I've been sitting here looking at pictures already been sent to me from uh, the western part of North Carolina uh, up in Asheville area where um, streets have already started to collapse. Um, we've got a huge uh, sinkholes that's starting to happen in the uh, mountain Asheville, Hendersonville area. We've lost uh, highways on the east coast uh, from the storm just a week ago down in the uh, Wilmington, Brunswick County area. So we're gonna have to take care of our highways because we cannot you know, grow land. That's something we've not been able to do. And we're gonna cannot continue to, to make more lanes. So it's very important that we take care of and manage our roads and fund our uh, transportation through the rail system. I uh, support rail and we need to get our rail uh, system up to date to where we can move more people efficiently and faster across this uh, country. 
So I totally support that and get our bridges uh, in shape and what we're gonna need to move um, traffic because that's the way that we're gonna, what we have to be concerned with. Um, transportation, everything in uh, transportation has a price attached to it. You know, we got commerce out there. People have to get the places. Everything's important. And where they need to be to, uh, doctors or doctor's appointments is to schools, to work. And so all that has a, a, a price attached to it. And it's very important that our transportation system is up to date and people are not caught sitting in traffic for hours at a time because our infrastructure of our highways have failed them. And our uh, interstate systems are outdated and were not, uh, when they were formed, we had, there was, you know, the ones who did it had no idea that our uh, motor vehicle traffic was going to be where it is today. So we've got to come up with another way to get our um, traffic moving across these United States. So thank you. I have enjoyed it. I support the National Infrastructure Bank and hope that we can uh, get something going soon. And another thing, we here in North Carolina and I'm in Charlotte, Mecklenburg, um, the private companies taking over our highway system for these toll roads. I think that they need to stay within the state. And I we just heard that I heard that a uh, private system is going to take over another portion of our I-77. And that because our DOT, we don't have the money to give the DOT to take care of these toll roads. And that's why I think the National Infrastructure Bank will come in handy for um, projects such as those, because we should be able to fund our own roads and not give them to private entities. Thank you very much. Very well said, uh, Representative Logan. We can't agree with you more. Uh, these private interests uh, 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 taking over our public uh, infrastructure systems will result in nothing more but higher costs uh, in order to uh, uh, produce a, uh, a profit for private industry at the expense of the public in general. So we oppose those as you do, and thank you for those great comments. Our last comment, I think tonight, uh, will come from Ingrid Clare, who has her hand up, and uh, we're uh, 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 thankful for your participation tonight and your comment. Thank you. Thank you. I just am very excited about the enthusiasm in this group of people. Um, you're so many are new that I have not met, and um, that's the way I I feel about this this whole program. And I've been working on it for some time. And um, I think I'm just going to give you some maybe some direction. Uh, anybody that you can connect with to spread the word, or especially connections in um, Congress or Senate. I like the idea of Mark Kelly. Um, that would be great because we can show them um, the whole presentation in 15 to 30 minutes. And um, I just want pe people to keep that in mind. That's how we've been growing. And thank you for everything. Everybody's been really great today. Thank you, Ingrid. Um and thank all of you for joining us tonight, and in particular, all the participants and speakers that uh, shared their thoughts and advocacy as far as the bank is concerned. This is going to take uh, an effort by all of us going forward, and uh, we having unity and understanding and commitment and agreement as to the direction that we go, which I think we do, uh, will enable us to be successful. So really appreciate everyone joining us tonight. Want to share with you that next month, uh, we are going to have uh, an event, uh, another Zoom webinar uh, with uh, uh, our uh, philosopher, uh, historian, and uh, an inspiring uh, expert, uh, Steve Feinberg, uh, who understands intimately what uh, 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 Franklin Delano Roosevelt accomplished uh, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and how applicable it is today. Uh, so please join us then. We will provide you notices uh, in the very near future. 
Please remember, we must advocate for the policy of a national infrastructure bank. That means contacting opinion leaders, elected officials, your community members. Uh, 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 please distribute uh, the handout that we have that you can print out from uh, the website that, that we have, and we are happy to send you uh, a printed uh, 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 materials ourselves, if that's not something that is easily accomplished by you. And of course, last but not least, the, uh, the, the, the necessary element of politics of money and uh, contributions and, uh, and uh, 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 promoting the bank is something that we really need uh, and hope uh, that you can assist us with. So uh, with that said, uh, uh, I'm going to wrap things up. The delegate, she wanted to say something. Uh, unless, uh, delegate, she, she please. I uh, have you a have question. Yes. Yeah. Could I have a question? I would love to share any like uh, expert presentations about the concept of NIB to the people who might be interested in the concept, but just want to learn more about it in order to promote it better, because it's still there's still a lot of technicality involved in this. Uh, so, so I'm sorry, uh, 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 your question is? Do you have like any uh, recorded presentations that we can easily share? They're on the website. Uh, okay. And, and uh, please understand that if anyone has any interest with regard to the bank that you know of, we are more than happy to have a Zoom with them in order to explain it in detail and respond to any particular questions they have. We are more than accommodating with regard to uh, sharing our thoughts and having a personal one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one relationship and meeting with them in order to explain and advocate for the bank. Thank you. You're very welcome. With that, uh, I'm going to, again, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Greatly appreciate it. We have a great team. We have a great concept. This is something for our country going forward that we need to have, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight, uh, uh, and uh, let us succeed with our endeavor.